Um, we're doing a transesophageal echo on a 61-year-old gentleman who was intubated three or four days ago. He originally came in with arrhythmia, it was conscious VT. He'd had a non-STEMI with troponins uh, above uh, 4,000 and some ECG changes, obviously. Um, and he went into uh, what looked like respiratory failure, with type 2 respiratory failure, as well as some hypoxia, and he was intubated. A few days later, it was deemed that he was uh, improving, and, he was, and an uh, extubation was attempted. And very quickly, he went into, again, went into respiratory distress with tachypnea, diaphoresis, cool peripheries, tachycardia, hypertension, and it looked very much like he was going into acute pulmonary edema. So we're now with him a few days later, and uh, we've done a transthoracic echo that has showed that he's got a new finding of uh, moderate aortic stenosis and some moderate LV dysfunction. Images were not straightforward. This gentleman's a, I've got a bit of a large BMI, and so what we've tried to do after, in the last sort of two days that we've been looking after him now is that we've given him a course of levosomendin to try and both help his LV systolic function as well as reduce maybe some of the lucitropy and try to help with that moderate aortic stenosis that raised left ventricle and diastolic pressure. So, uh, along with uh, the, the uh, levosomendin, we've also diuresed him and we're now left with him on moderate amounts of uh, noradrenaline. Uh, he's completed his levosomendin uh, infusion and what we're going to try and do now is to try and see if there's a chance that we can look at see how bad his left atrial pressure is particularly when we start weaning his peep. So currently as you can see from his ventilator he's on peeps of 14 hasn't got a huge oxygen requirement and one of the things we're going to try and determine is as we reduce the peep what happens to his left atrial pressure. So what we're going to try and do now is uh, do a spontaneous breathing trial of sorts. We're going to try and assess her left atrial pressures first of all and then we're going to reduce the peep and see how it changes. So, Chris, how are we going to assess the left atrial pressure with transesophageal echo? So, as we put the probe in to start with, our first view that we get is often the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. Um, and this is quite convenient because you straight away get a really nice view of your left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. So, I think from this we can straight away see that um, left ventricle and the left atrium do look a little bit dilated, left atrium particularly, mm -hmm. um, and the right ventricle kind of looks okay. And I've got to say, yeah. just compared to the transthoracic echo images yeah. that were pretty hard yesterday, I do think that left ventricle looks like it is contracting better than it was before. There was moderate uh, dysfunction. They're talking about an ejection fraction of about 30, 35%. I think that looks more like 45%. Yeah. So I think yeah. levosomendin is doing what it says on the tin. Firstly, we look at what the heart looks like. Um, and... Uh, after we've done that, then we can start to play with some Doppler. So I would normally start by putting some color Doppler over the mitral valve. But yeah, what's, that, what's that with the, so what's interestingly, the mitral valve? Interestingly, there is um, mitral regurgitation that's oh, coming in there. Yeah. I just withdraw very slightly and you can start to see there's a pretty good going mitral regurgitation jet. So, you know, we're looking at left atrial pressure. We want to look about weaning failure and mitral regurgitation is particularly something that we want to be aware of. Um, this is probably quite a comfortable state for him now, so the mitral regurgitation is likely to... Yeah, and you say it's going to be comfortable because he's got a whole bunch of raised intrathoracic pressure from the ventilator and the peeps exactly. of 14. So if we reduce that, we are going to increase his LV afterload, which is probably already increasing he's got his aortic stenosis. Um, so uh, as I wean him, I'm going to increase the LV afterload. So what do we think that's going to happen to the mitral regurgitation? Uh, when we wean the yeah, ventilation, we the ventilation. Well, it's likely to get worse. Yeah, 100%. So he's going to have loads of endogenous catecholamine circulating, so a big stress response. You know, reduce, um, you know, currently he's in a reduced afterload state, yeah. which in itself reduces the severity of mitral regurgitation. So that is likely to worsen. Mm -hmm. uh, just of note before we move on, um, just look at the rest of your colour box, and you, we can see here that there's a little bit of unusual colour Doppler coming in from the, where the aortic valve is as well. So just being aware that there's also probably a significant amount of aortic regurgitation, not just aortic stenosis. It's interesting, you probably just had the alarm just go off on the ventilator. What's quite interesting is I think because of his heart failure, we're actually seeing this um, kind of chain stokes breathing pattern where he actually becomes apneic for short periods of time and then the tidal volumes come back in. They're small at first, they gradually get bigger each time. We've got 90 mils up to 190 mils up to 466 mils, and he then gets a bit more tachypneic, and then it gets slow, and the tidal volumes decrease again. And I think this is all because of his heart failure, which is obviously uh, one of the things that can cause a chain stokes breathing pattern. Yeah, 
nice. It might um, maybe mess up the diastology a little bit. Maybe we've just got to try and time it the same when we're yeah. assessing it in both, Probably. both um, peak challenges. So I guess the main things I'm going to be looking for for left atrial pressure. So one, structural. Two is any other valvular pathology like mitral regurgitation. Yeah. Then I'm going to start to try to look at the conventional diastology things that we look at. Now, toe is a bit more tricky than maybe transthoracic if we're trying to get lateral E prime values because of um, alignment. But I'll tend, to, I'll tend to be doing mitral E wave, EA ratio, um, E of E prime, and then probably be looking at things like pulmonary veins. Yeah, nice. I think on the E to A ratio as well, the D cell time I D -cell find time, quite yeah. useful. I use a kind of cut off by, you know, 140, 160 or so to tell me if it's less than that, that's, you know, super fast, that sign of restricted filling. If it's, you know, closer to the 240, that's kind of normal. And so we'll make all those measurements and compare them before and after. Yeah. So why don't so, we start with the E and the A ratios? Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to take the cursor and I'm going to place it just um, distal to the mitral leaflet tips and I'm going to press pulse wave Doppler. So we're going to get a trace that's going downwards because blood is flowing into the left ventricle. Um, just making sure I've got reasonable alignment there. So we can get the peak E wave. Oh, that's interesting. So it's really high, isn't it? Yeah. So normal E-wave velocity is what, about one? Ooh. And we've got an E velocity there of, uh, you know, 1.4 meters per second. Um, so we know that the E velocity can be increased by significant mitral regurg. The idea being that if you've got a whole bunch of blood coming backwards that, uh, through the mitral regurg, then you've got a whole bunch of blood coming forwards through the mitral valve, and that can increase up your E-wave velocity. It's all just, you know, uh, flow dependent. So if you've got more blood, the higher the velocity. So 1.2, that's suggesting that we've got significant uh, mitral regurgitation, you know, pointing more towards the severe end of the scale there. Yeah. He's also on catecholamines. He's also probably, you know, potentially still in a bit of an overloaded state. Yeah. So we'll see how we go. Um, next thing you said, E to A ratio. What have we? What's the E to A ratio? E to A ratio two is two point five. So again, what's, uh, what do we think about that? Uh, well, that's significantly raised. So over yeah. two is classically yeah. your restrictive um, physiology. Yeah, nice. um, thoughts on interpretation of diastology in the context of. Um, mitral regurgitation. There's probably at least moderate severity. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's going to be some caveats with this, right? So the E to A ratio is probably going to, it's not validated when you've got significant mitral valve pathology, either stenosis or regurgitation. So we've got to take it with a pinch of salt, I guess. But for what I think might be useful, though, is absolutely those kind of static parameters. We can't use that to estimate left atrial pressure. But what we can use this is when we change the peak, looking yep. at the change in it. And I think if the E wave goes up, if that D cell comes down, what was the deceleration time? Uh, D-cell time was 2.14. 2.14. So if that D-cell time comes down, you know, maybe that's an indication of uh, raising uh, left atrial pressures and the fact that if I tried to extubate him, he might go back into pulmonary edema. Yeah. Great. So I also think we've got other information we can get. Uh, yeah. So what did you say? We said the E2A ratio, D-cell time. E over um, E prime. E over E prime. So let's have a look to see those. And then the last thing is the pulmonary vent. Yeah. So for E over E prime, we're going to get both it from the lateral mitral annulus and the septal mitral annulus. So placing our cursor over the mitral annulus first, yeah. pressing tissue doppler and pulse wave. And so we've got to remember everything's flipped around the other way, right? So the S prime is underneath the um, uh, it's underneath the baseline, and then yep. that first peak backwards, that's the E prime. So. E prime, so probably around the middle of this notch here. Yeah, and I try to make sure that we're reducing that gain, looking for that modal velocity. Yeah. I just made one measurement, but I'm looking at the whole cursor yeah. across it, trying to yeah. pick a sort of average between those two. Yeah. And it's nice that it seems to correlate for all of them. Actually. Nice. So that's a e every prime of 21.6. 21.6 for the lateral. And right down, we had an E to A ratio of 2. three or so, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll get the same from the Medial. So I'm just going to roll the probe slightly round just to see if I can get the best alignment possible. Nice. Um, not going to be completely optimal on toe, but um, probably the best that we've got at the moment. <laughs> All right. So again, same thing. So we've turned the gain right down, um, and once again we've got 19.4 on the yeah. septum. All right, so now last piece of the puzzle, let's go and have a look at, um, E3 prime average was 20.4. 20. 
20.4 average. So let's look at our pulmonary veins. Yeah. And just in the meaning of time, I think maybe we'll do another talk sometime about how to look at all the pulmonary valves. I think we've got a central regurgitation jet. Let's just look at the left upper pulmonary vein, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So place a bit of color, Doppler over the side. So normally, there's a couple of ways that I would do the, the left upper. So starting at um, maybe 90, um, Nice degrees, so you should get the left atrial appendage. It's on the right hand side of my screen, so I just need to slightly withdraw the probe. Losing a little bit of contact there. Um, but we've got the left upper coming in right there. I'll do. That'll do. Um, so, so normally pulmonary vein flow, so we'd expect the S wave, so that's during systole, to be bigger than the D wave. So systole from the beginning in the QRS to the end of the T wave. So that smaller wave that should be bigger, right? So that is a sign for me of raised left atrial pressure. So the S wave less than the D wave. Uh, and here we get an actual ratio. So 0.4 for S and our D wave. Beautiful. So it's interesting. If we were just to take all those static parameters, uh, you'd say that we've got raised left atrial pressure. The kick is going to be that A is critically ill and none of the parameters have been actually validated. The second of all would be that he has got significant mitral regurgitation. I'm probably going to call it moderate based on yep. the pulmonary veins and what I've seen before. Yep. So uh, I think as a static parameter, we'd probably say that he has raised left atrial pressure yes. and could probably stop it at that. Yep. I think it's a bit harder because his eyes have also got moderate aortic stenosis. Yeah. I think it's not unreasonable to have a look what happens to these parameters by reducing his peep transiently and seeing what happens to these parameters and seeing if they can change. So yeah. whilst we're on this, what I'm yeah. now going to do is I'm now going to drop the peep and I'm transiently going to drop the peep to what, should we say, six? Sure, sounds it's, good to me. It's a, it's a pretty punchy drop. We're just going to do it just transiently. And this is going to give us an idea because, I mean, if he's kind of got this fixed left, raised left atrial pressure state, we're not going to see these parameters change that much. Um, but if they do go up significantly, again, I think it's an indication we need to do more diuresis yep. and you know, have a good think about how to try and slow his heart rate down, even though he's on noradrenaline. Do we try and wean that norad more so that we can try and look at slowing that heart rate down before we extubate him? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess whilst there's mitral regurgitation and probably some diastolic dysfunction that we're thinking about, um, I guess the management for both of those things are pretty similar. So Fair either way, we're going to probably be doing similar interventions. Interesting the tidal volumes have increased as we start to do that. I don't know, has that mitral regurgitation got worse? I was thinking that. I don't know whether I'm just trying to convince myself, but I think that probably has been what, what was the scale that you had him on before? Is it about the same? Same, I haven't changed yeah. the scale. Yeah. Interesting, okay. I think we'll I'm see when we look back at the recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So reducing the peak, we've, we've increased that afterload. Yeah, increased the LV afterload. We've also probably increased the LV preload, because yep. we've reduced that afterload on the right side of the heart, increased the right side preload. So I guess if you're doing serial measurements, you've just got to try to make sure you're doing it from the same point every time. Yeah, and we also do it at the same time in the cardiac, at uh, the same time in the respiratory cycle, so when he's actually sort of breathing up. So if you don't mind just waiting for just a little bit. Okay, he's just starting to breathe up again now. So we'll do it when he's got his larger tidal volumes. So I think any time from now. Again, it's not perfect because there's a bit of spectral broadening. Um, Bocock would <laughs> bag me out for that. Um, oh, you're doing a great job. So, oh, okay. That's interesting, okay. So I forgot what the diesel time, I forgot to write it down. It was, two, it was two, over 200. It was over 200, I think it was 230 so. or something. Okay, so we've got an E to A ratio now of 2.6, I guess 2.3 up to 2.6. Yeah. We've got a D cell time of 164. So it was 230 yep. to 164. So both of those suggest we've got increased, um, inc uh, increased you know, restrictive atrial, uh, pattern. Yeah. yeah, increased restrictive pattern. So increasing left atrial pressure. All right. And obviously we need to try not to measure it and have everything yeah. go over your yeah. That's what measurement you're, area. Yeah. yeah good <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I've only written down the uh, lateral yeah. inceptor.
Uh, okay, uh, yeah, do you totally want me to do this again? Set to uh, yeah, but I can't remember what they were the first time. All I wrote down was the E2E Prime. Yeah, I don't remember it. We'll, we'll tell you what, we'll take it, we'll come yeah. back. It's our first recording doing this, perhaps. Yeah. We'll get better with time. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, lateral E Prime. Okay, so it's 6.4. You can go back and look. So that was 6.4. And septal. The one I'm most interested in is going to see what these pulmonary veins do. Yeah. They go for it now, and that's in the same phase as the respiratory cycle. Yeah. Okay, it's 4.7. So that's gone up. The E of Re Prime has gone up. Yeah, nice. Because that's, yeah, because you can even see it because they were. 21 and 19 feet. Yeah. Particularly, I thought the septal looked like it went down more than the lateral. That's interesting. It did, yeah. And then um, pulmonary veins. Pulmonary and we had a uh, 0.4 was the ratio. Just give it two seconds. I'll breathe up again from his chain stokes pattern. Nice. Ready? It's over there? Yeah. Good. So again, I'm going to do systolic. So again, we've got QRS here. So this is going to be systolic here. Yeah. We're going to have diastolic here. Yes, yeah, so it's about the same. We've got point four and point five. Yeah. Interesting. But clearly shows features of raised oh, pressure. Oh, absolutely, raised left atrial pressures. So I'm guessing, let me just put this guy, let me put him back up to 14. All right, so I mean, I think we've got significant changes that have gone, there, gone on there, particularly a rise in the E to A ratio. We've got a rise in the E to E prime. Yeah. We've got a reduction in your D cell time. The S and the D wave ratio is about the same. I think those all indicate that when we reduce the PEEP, we increased up his afterload, increased his preload, and he had rise in his left atrial pressure. Yeah. Well, that says to me that he is nowhere near being ready for extubation. No. I think from here, I, we need to wean the PEEP slowly. We need to keep going diuresis. I'm going to wait for negative a litre a day, and we are going to try and wean that NORAD so that we can start to consider maybe, if we could get it low enough, even try and slow that heart rate down to help with the lucitropia of the left ventricle. Nice. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Nice imaging, nice display of heart-lung interactions there. We're looking at left atrial pressure and peep, so thank you very much. Thanks very much.